want to invite you to take your Bibles and uh, open them up to the book of Hebrews uh, as we start back up in Hebrews together. And we are in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 16 together this morning. And it's, uh, it's good to be back in the book of Hebrews. Uh, it was great to be able to, to take a break for uh, Advent, but I'm so excited to get back into this book. It's been a great encouragement in my own faith, uh, as I hope it's been in yours. Uh, and as we wrap up this book in the last couple chapters, uh, really we are in the application part uh, of this letter now where the writer is encouraging us and strengthening us and calling us to walk of the walk of faith that he has been uh, putting before us uh, throughout this, this book. Now we left off in chapter 11, which is often referred to as the great hall of faith. And as Pastor Neil opened us up into that section, you remember he talked about we're walking into a, a hallway and on the sides of that hallway, we see the pictures of all those that have walked before us faithfully. And, and the writer is trying to get us to be strengthened and encouraged by the faith of those that had walked before us as we, as we see their faith, that we are reminded that we too can be strengthened by the Lord to walk faithfully to the calling of which he has called us to. And as we walked down that hall, we saw the, the faith of Abel. We saw the faith of Enoch and of Noah. And now as we continue on in chapter 11, it's like we come to the end of that hallway and it opens up into a grand room where on the, in that grand room there's a giant mural. And that giant mural reflects the faith of Abraham. And as the writer brings us to uh, Abraham, he highlights for us the faith of this man who both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, this faith of Abraham is commended to us. And I think as we look at this life and faith of Abraham, it's important for us to remember that Abraham is just a man, that he was sinful like you and I, that he was dependent like you and I. And that the purpose of the text is not for us to go, oh, look at Abraham, I could never be like him, but just the opposite, to look at Abraham and to see that Abraham's God was faithful and he will be faithful to you and he will be faithful to me. It is the grace that Abraham receives by God for his faith that we are to see and to realize that, yes, you too can walk in faith as Abraham as God sustained his faith. And he is given as an example in this chapter for the church to follow, for us to follow. This faith is possible. That's what the writer is trying to say to us this morning. And so let's look at the faith of Abraham. And before we do that, we have to understand the, the setting of this book for us to really understand what the, what the writer is trying to get us to, to understand this morning. It's important that we understand the, the setting so that we understand the, the, the what aspects of the faith that the writer wants us to see. What does he want us to see about Abraham's faith? And then why does he want us to see these specific aspects of Abraham's faith? There's a reason why he, he says what he says, and hopefully we'll see that this morning. And so it's important for us to understand a few things. First of all, the author. Well, we don't know who the author is. We talked about that when we looked at the book of Hebrews and we did our introduction. The author of Hebrews is, is really unknown to us. There's a lot of guesses of who he is, but the reality is what's clear is that this author knows these people. He knows them closely, intimately. Perhaps he was even their pastor at one time. He knows these people. He knows what they are going through. He knows the suffering that they have endured, the suffering that they are enduring, and the suffering that they will endure. And he is writing to them to strengthen them in the midst of that suffering, to prepare them, and to help them to keep their eyes fixed on Christ. You see, the readers or the recipients of this letter were, were Christians who were of Jewish descent and Jewish background. And they are living in a time and in a culture where persecution for being a Christian is being intensified. They've already experienced some persecution, we'll see uh, in chapter 12, but they're, they're experiencing now more. The persecution is beginning to grow and intensify, and the writer is writing to strengthen them in the midst of what is coming. 
And he is, he is telling them to keep their eyes on Christ. You see, what's happening is that they're being tempted to return back to Judaism because Judaism was safer for them. To go back to Judaism would be a, a safer, culturally uh, acceptable religion as opposed to what Christianity was. And so they were being tempted. They were being tempted to go back to what they knew, back to what was comfortable, back to what was safe. And the writer is warning them. And he does that through both the carrot and the stick. You remember, he, he does that through both the blessings that you're going to miss. Like, do not miss the blessings that God is going to give you in Christ Jesus. But then he also is going to give them warnings and say, listen, do not do this. This, is, this will bring disastrous consequences if you turn away from Christ. And as he, as he writes, he's urging them to hold on, to remain faithful to Christ, that Christ and his blessings are far more glorious than any suffering that they will endure in this life for following after Christ. And it's this background, it's this understanding of, of, that we need to understand so that we can hear the nuances of what the writer is trying to say as he, as he tells them to keep their eyes on the eternal, as he tells them to look at the faith of Abraham, how he never gave up, even though he didn't attain what was promised at the time. He, rem, he remembered the promises of God and he remained faithful. And that's what he wants them to do as well. You see, Abraham is the perfect example to them to remind them of those truths that a Abraham demonstrated faith in, in unknown circumstances when he didn't know what was going to happen. He demonstrated faith in, in what was seemingly impossible circumstances, like how would God possibly do what he said he was going to do? And he demonstrated faith in an eternal future where he did not place his eyes just on what was before him, but what God had promised would come. And that's what the writer wants them to do. And that's what the Lord wants us to do. And so as we look at the faith of Abraham, we see that this faith is possible, not only for them, but for us as well. For the Lord is faithful to his promises. So let's learn from the faith of Abraham this morning. Turn to chapter 11. We're going to begin in verse 8 together. And we'll go through verse 16 this morning. Next week, we'll pick back up on the life of Abraham and finish, finish out the, the second section. But this morning, beginning in verse 8, God's word says this. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man... And him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, Lord, may we be reminded of your faithfulness, of your promises, of the grace that you have given to your people to sustain them through suffering, to sustain them through the darkest moments of life. Lord, that we would hold fast to your word and never let go. Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed and focused on Jesus Christ. 
Help this world, Lord, to grow strangely dim to us, Father, as we live as strangers and aliens. Lord, may our eyes be fixed and focused on Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that we would learn from the faithfulness of those who have gone before us. And Lord, that we too might understand that you are faithful. And so, Lord, teach us now from your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Now, there's a, a ton that we could see in this passage, but I, I want to bring our attention this morning to what I think the writer is trying to drive home for these readers, and that is that, that Abraham demonstrated faith in, in very difficult circumstances, and that that faith is open to us as well, because we serve the same faithful God with the same faithful promises. And so the first instance or the first situation that we see here is that faith is faith in the unknown, is that Abraham demonstrated faith in unknown circumstances, in circumstances where he had no idea what lay before him, he demonstrated faith. Look at verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Now, this story is recorded for us in Genesis chapter 12 and following. If you are uh, maybe starting uh, the Bible and doing a read through of the Bible this year, chances are you were right in this passage this week. You were reading about Abraham and, and the faith of Abraham. And in chapter 12, we see that God comes to Abraham, a man who is living in a pagan culture. Uh, with a pagan, he's from a, a pagan background, a pagan family, uh, and God calls him out of that in the land of Ur and tells him to go to a new land that God has promised to him. Abraham is around 75 years old at this time, and so he, is, he has been living in this land, he is set in this land, and God is calling him to leave everything that he knows and to follow and to obey. Now, sometimes we read a story like that, and we don't really let the reality of the circumstance set in for us. We think, oh, of course Abraham obeyed. But think about how difficult it is for you and I to just make a move in our lives, right? And, and if, we, if we move, first of all, we hate to do that because we've got to pack up all of the, everything that we have, right? This is horrible. But when we move, we, we don't move like just, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know what I'm going to do, right? No, we, we have it all planned out. We know the house we're going to go to, the job we're going to have. We're looking for doctors ahead of time and dentists and schools and all that kind of stuff. We want to have all the details figured out before we make that move. Abraham had none of that. And so you have to set yourself in that moment and to think about what that felt like to be told, go, even though you have no idea what lays ahead for you. Will you be faithful? The closest thing I can, I can relate to it, and, and it's not even close to what Abraham experienced, but when, when the Lord called us to Central Oregon, we were living in Washington, and, and we felt like God was calling us to plant a church, and, and we had no idea what all that meant. We had no idea what that was going to look like. We had no idea who was going to go with or who was not. We had no idea who was going to be there when we got there. Uh, we had somewhat of an idea of what we were going to rent when we got here, but that was about it. We, we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into, but we knew the Lord was calling us to that, and so we faithfully followed his calling. And it was scary, and it was exciting, and it was a time where our faith grew in tremendous ways. But that was nothing compared to what Abraham experienced. He wasn't going to Bend, Oregon. He was going to the desert. I mean, we, we kind of joke sometimes. We're like, well, we're suffering for Jesus, right? No, we're not suffering for Jesus. We, we live in a beautiful place. We've been called to a wonderful place to be able to serve the Lord. Abraham had no idea where he was going. He simply had to trust God. And that's exactly what he does, right? That's what the writer emphasizes for us. By faith, Abraham obeyed. That's the evidence of faith. Obedience doesn't save us, but obedience is always shown as the evidence of us being saved. 
Obedience is always the evidence of faith. And here we see that Abraham obeyed. In, in chapter 11, verse 1, we see the description of what faith is, right? It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And that assurance, that conviction is demonstrated through obedience. Friends, if you say you believe, there should be some fruit in your life. There should be some evidence of your life that, that you actually trust the promises of God and are holding to those promises of God and are living in light of those promises of God. That's what faith looks like. That's what Abraham is an example to us. For Abraham, that meant listening to God's word and following God's word. And for us, it means the same. For Abraham, it meant he left. He went out, right? Look at the text. It says, he went out, not knowing where he was going. The writer is emphasizing the extent of Abraham's faith in the midst of the unknown. He lived in a foreign land, that he lived in tents, that he never actually experienced the full promises that were made to him. He simply walked by faith. And why would he do that? Why would he leave everything he knew? Why would he go out into a, a foreign land and live in a tent when he's, li he's leaving a metropolitan area? Why would he do that? Well, the writer says it's because he believed in the promises of God. It's because God had promised and Abraham believed those promises. Look at verse 9. Listen to that word promise over and over again. He says, by faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land living in tents with Isaac and Jacob and heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Four times the writer emphasizes in this section the promises of God. Abraham is listening to God and believing in those promises. And ultimately, verse 10 emphasizes the real promise that Abraham was trusting in. Look, listen to verse 10. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. The writer is telling us that Abraham wasn't looking for an earthly plot of land. He was looking for a place to dwell with God. He was looking for an eternal home with God himself. And he, he, he says it in ways, he says he was looking for a city who, that has the city, that has the foundations, whose designer and builder is God. It is the same city the writer is wanting the readers of uh, this time that he's writing to them that he wants them to focus on. And it's the same city that he wants us to put our focus on. Yes, we are citizens of the U.S., and what a blessing that is. But more importantly for us, we are citizens of heaven. Our ambassadorship, our citizenship is in heaven. And the question is, are we living like that? Do we actually live like our citizenship is in heaven? Is that our, our greatest uh, uh, desire? Is that our greatest hope? Or is our hope all earthly? Is our hope in who the next leader of our country is going to be? Is that, are we going to just get just, just destroyed over an election season with anger and frustration and, or, or happiness and glee based on who's in the White House? Or is our hope going to be in the sovereign God of the universe who rules and reigns and his peace will be, his peace will be ours no matter what? What is it going to look like as we walk through a difficult time? Now, I'm not saying don't pay attention, don't vote, don't care. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying don't allow your hope to be fixed in this world because you will be devastated. You are a citizen of heaven. And the writer says, act like it. Act like your citizenship is actually in heaven, knowing that the king of kings still reigns no matter what the economy is like, no matter what inflation looks like, you have an eternal treasure that cannot be taken away. Is that where your hope is? Or is your hope in the earthly and the temporal? When people see us as Christians, 
Do they see something different in us? Do they see that we're citizens of heaven? Or do we look just like everyone else? You see, they should see somebody who has hope and faith in the unknown. Hope and faith in the uncertain. When we don't know what's going to happen around the corner, and that's the reality, right? We don't know what's going to happen. That's what's driving fear among everybody. They're so fearful of what is to happen. I can't tell you what's going to happen, but I can tell you that there is a God who is faithful over it all. I can tell you there's a God who is sovereign over all of it, and he will be with us, and he will lead us to good and not to harm. The, see, the promises of God are what we hold on to. That's what it means to be a citizen of heaven. So how do you have hope in the unknown? Well, he tells us you trust in the promises of God. You listen to God's word and God's voice louder than all the other voices around you. And if there's one thing I can encourage you in this new year, it is find ways to listen to the voice of God. Be in God's word, both individually and corporately and as a family. Be in God's word and allow those promises to wash over your life this year so that you know God's word, so that you can obey God's word. That's how you know if you have faith in the promises of God. Do you obey? Abraham is an example. But not only does Abraham have faith in the unknown, the writer starts there, but then he goes even more intense and he shows us that Abraham had faith in the seemingly impossible. Abraham had faith, faith in the seemingly impossible. It, I, I added that word seemingly there because it, it seems like this situation is impossible and yet God, with God, nothing is impossible. You see, if trusting God for a new home, if a new location was going to be difficult for Abraham, then trusting God for a son in the midst of his old age seemed impossible. Listen to verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man... And him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Now, Abraham was 75 years old when God called him and promised him that he was going to have an heir. That's old, right? But that's not, that, that's not as old as he's going to be when he finally has Isaac. The text emphasizes for us the impossibility of this circumstance by saying this, he was a man as good as dead in verse 12, right? That's really old. Like he's emphasizing to us in human power, in human strength, what God was saying was going to happen was absolutely impossible. Abraham must have wondered when he heard that, how, Lord, how, how are you going to do this? This seems impossible. And when God was taking too long, in Abraham's mind and in Sarah's mind to fulfill this promise. Years had gone on, almost a decade had passed, and the promise still had not been fulfilled yet. Abraham took things into his own hands, and uh, Sarah gave him, his, uh, gave him uh, her, her servant, uh, Hagar, uh, to be his wife. And, 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 and through that, they had a child named Ishmael when Abraham was 86 years old. And, and if you know anything about the history of the Middle East and, 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 and uh, have read Genesis, you realize that that conflict that is there is a direct result of this reality of, of Ishmael and Isaac and the battle and the war that would, would, would come from those two lineages. Because of man trying to do something for God instead of allowing God to fulfill the promises that he had given disaster came out of that. It's a reminder to us that Abraham is not perfect, that Abraham and Sarah are far from perfection. They're, they're not given to us as models of, of what we cannot be. They're given us to models to see these are broken people just like you and me, and yet their God 
was faithful. When Abraham is 99 years old, God fulfills the promise. When, when, when Abraham has Ishmael, God tells him, that's not the child. That's not the child I promised you. You will have a child, but it will come through Sarah. She will bear you a child. Friends, that seemed impossible. That seemed unrealistic. And yet, if you were reading in that this week, you rem- remember that verse that says, is anything too uh, hard for God? Is anything too impossible for God? No, nothing is impossible for God. And in verse 11, the writer emphasizes the faith of Sarah and Abraham. Now, verse 11 is, is a hotly debated uh, passage among Bible scholars, and I can't go into all the details of it, but, but you, you need to realize that the, the subject of this verse is a little confusing, and, and, and scholars have gone back, on, back and forth. Is the subject supposed to be Abraham, who received the power to conceive, or is the subject supposed to be Sarah? Now, the text in the flow of the text, seems like logically this should be Abraham, right? All of this is about Abraham's faith and all. It it seems like that's what it should be. And yet the grammar here seems to strongly indicate that, that it's Sarah. That's why every English translation you have, pretty much almost all of them are uniform in saying Sarah is the subject here. She is the one that is shown as having faith. And we don't know exactly why the writer is emphasizing that, but perhaps the writer is is emphasizing Sarah so that in this church that he's writing to, both men and women understand God's looking for men and women of faithfulness. That that God is looking for those that will walk in faithfulness. And and it's not just Abraham, it is Sarah. And, And Sarah gets a hard rap, right? There's times that she laughs and times that, and Abraham laughed too, but there's times that, you know, Sarah gets a hard rap that she just had no faith. And here the writer is, is, is emphasizing, no, no, she had faith as well. She had faith to leave and follow Abraham when he left to go to a land. I mean, can you imagine as a wife, like leaving, having no idea what was laying out before you? And here she had faith to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to be with Abraham, to bear a child. And so she demonstrated faith. The situation here seemed impossible, but with God, nothing was impossible. Now, whether it's Sarah or Abraham, if you're a Bible scholar, you can go study that and you can make your own determination on that. Whether it's Sarah or Abraham really is is not the significant issue. The significant issue is the faith. It is the faith that is being emphasized here And it is the power of that faith and the one who provided that faith that is the focus. And God is looking for faithful men and faithful women who will trust him even in the impossible. Again, how are we to have faith in the midst of impossible situations? It's the same answer. We trust in the promises of God. That's what the writer's emphasizing. One of the greatest illustrations of that, I think, in our lives is actually how we come to faith in Christ. What seems impossible, that God would rescue us, that God would save us from our sin simply by believing and trusting in what Jesus Christ has done, that you and I can be saved eternally through that, seems impossible. You know, when you're sharing that message with someone else, you ever stop and think like, man, this, this sounds crazy. Like I sound crazy right now as I'm sharing this, but this is what I believe. This is what my faith is in. That God will do what he says he will do. And you know what he says he will do? He says that if you will call out to him and believe that his son Jesus died for you, that he went to the cross for your sins, that he went into the grave and he rose from the grave three days later, conquering sin and death. If you will have faith in that, you will be saved. God is in the business of doing the impossible. And the first step of faith that we have when we come to him is exactly that. It is believing and trusting in the promise that we can receive salvation through Jesus Christ and his finished work. And I hope, I hope that you have trusted in that promise that God makes to you. You see, God is in the business of doing what what seems impossible to us. 
he does through his power and his strength. Salvation is one example of that. I don't know what seems impossible to you right now. I don't know what you're going through, what that feels like there's no way that this can get better. But I want to remind you this morning that God is able and that he wants us to draw near to him. He wants us to cast our cares on him. He wants us to trust him and put our faith in him. And he promises to be with us. Now listen, he doesn't promise that he will always heal us in this world. That's not a promise he makes. But he does promise that one day he will ultimately heal us. Ultimately, whatever we experience will be, will be resurrected and we will be with God forever. That's where our hope is. He doesn't promise to remove all of our pain in this world. That's not a promise he makes. But he does promise that one day all pain will be removed and every tear will be wiped away from our eyes. These are the eternal promises that we must hold on to. These are the eternal promises that, that on face value at times seem impossible. And yet that's exactly what God's in the business of doing. He's in the business of doing the impossible. And what the writer wants the readers of Hebrews to do is to take their eyes off their temporal circumstances of suffering that they're enduring and put them on the eternal reward of Jesus Christ. And we see that in verses 13 through 16. We see that Abraham not only had faith in the unknown and faith in the seemingly impossible, but Abraham had faith in an eternal future. Faith in the future. Look at verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Do you notice what he's emphasizing there? He's emphasizing that they, Abraham never saw these promises in his lifetime. He never saw the total fulfillment of these promises. His children didn't see them. His great great grandchildren or his grandchildren didn't see him and his great grandchildren didn't see him. For 400 years Abraham's descendants would be in slavery in Egypt. And they must have often wondered, did God forget us? Did God forget about his promises? Didn't he tell us that we would have a land? Didn't he tell us that we would be a nation? What, what is going on here? And sometimes that's what it feels like when we only focus on the temporal. When we look at the things around us and we go, what is going on? God, why is your kingdom not permeating this world? Why, why are we not seeing more righteousness? Why are we not seeing more, more honoring of those that follow you? Why does it feel like, like when we follow you, we're, we're exiles and strangers and aliens in this world? Because that's what it's going to feel like until the eternal promises are fulfilled. You see, the writer wants them to keep their focus on eternity, to realize that the promises of God are ultimately going to be fulfilled, but they're, they're probably not going to be fulfilled in their lifetime on this earth. And they're probably not going to be fulfilled in our lifetime, although they could. At any moment, the Lord could return. But what he's trying to emphasize here is, is what happened to Abraham and his descendants. What happened to them? Well, they died, never seeing the promises fulfilled. They died in faith. And the writer's saying, that might be what happens to you. And that might be what happens to me. We may go all the way to the very end of our lives, just holding on to faith. And then one day that faith will be made sight. They never saw the promises. They lived as strangers and exiles on earth. And isn't that how we're supposed to live? Isn't that what we're encouraged, how we're encouraged to, to look and to see our own existence? In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Peter says this to the church, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, 
which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Peter says we are to live as strangers and aliens because this is not our home. We are not, this, this is not our ultimate citizenship. Our ultimate citizenship is with God forever. And that's how we're to live. That's how the Hebrews were to live. That's how you and I are to live. Not for the glories of this world, not for the treasures of, of what this world offers us, but for the glories that are to come. We are to keep our eyes fixed and focused on Christ. Jesus says in Matthew 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. also. That's what it means to live as a citizen of heaven. And so friends, as you look at your own life, what does that obedience look like for you? Where are you storing your treasures? As you look at your bank account, what does it say about what you believe? I know you're like, oh, no, no, pastor, don't, don't start talking about money now. Like there's, you can talk about a lot of things, but don't talk about money. That's what the Lord Jesus says. He says, if you want to see obedience, if you want to see faithfulness, there are tangible ways for us to do that. One of them is to look at our bank account and say, where am I putting my treasures? Is it in the next vacation? Is it in a bigger house? Is it in a nicer car? Is it in, in, in things of this world? What Jesus says here is that that stuff is going to evaporate. Where are you putting your treasures? Where is your heart? That is a reflection of the citizenship that you are focused on. Is it of this earth or is it of his kingdom? Where do you invest? Where do I invest? My time, my talents, my treasures. That speaks of where my heart is. What is the promised land that you are seeking? Is it in this world? Is it a better job? Is it a perfect house? Or is it an eternal kingdom? You see, the emphasis of the author here is that for Abraham, it was not an earthly treasure. It was an eternal treasure. Look at verse 14. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have opportunity to return back to it. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. What the writer is saying is that they were strangers and exiles in this world. And if they wanted to solve that problem, all they had to do was go back to their homeland. But that's not what they did. They remained strangers. Why? Because they were looking for a better country. They were looking for the promises that God had made and they were holding fast to, to those promises no matter what their earthly circumstance looked like. They were looking for a better country. That word better, that is key to the book of Hebrews. We've talked about it over and over and over again. The writer is trying to help them to see that Christ is better than anything they're being tempted to return to. Christ is the better messenger with the better message. He is the better priest. He is the better hope. He is the better covenant. He is the better sacrifice. And here he is the better country. You know, we are blessed. We live in a wonderful country. It's got issues. It's got problems. It's got challenges. But man, when it's all said and done, we live in a wonderful country. But you know what? There is a better country that awaits us. As good as this is, it is nothing compared to the eternal place that God has prepared for those who remain faithful. And that's the emphasis the author is making. 
He's telling us to remain faithful. Don't get distracted by the suffering you are enduring right now. Don't get distracted by the worldly pleasures that that lure you away. Keep your eyes fixed on Christ because those who remain faithful will experience a better country, a country where Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords for all of eternity and his people will dwell with him forever and ever. That's where he wants us to keep our eyes fixed on. That's what he wants us to follow in the example of Abraham. It's a reminder that he wants to give to the Hebrews that are being tempted to sacrifice the the, the eternal for the temporal. And that's the reminder he wants to give to us as well. We might not face the same exact temptation of wanting to return to Judaism, but we face the same temptation of wanting to hold on to the temporal in light of the eternal. And the writer is saying, Those that have faith, let go of the temporal and hold on to the promises of God no matter what. They live their lives by those promises. They orient their lives to those promises and they trust in God's word. And so the message is the same for us. Hold on. Keep your eyes on Christ. Don't give up. Don't quit. Hold on and remain faithful. God's promises will be fulfilled in his timing, but they will only be given to those who have remained faithful. So keep standing and remaining in faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. And God, I pray, Lord, that That as we hear it, we would not hear a message that says, try harder in your own strength. That's not what you're saying this morning, Lord. It It is to be more dependent upon the promises of God. It is to be more dependent upon the strength of God. To trust that our God is faithful, that that his promises are true and right, and to hold on to those. And so, Lord, I pray, God, that by your spirit and through your word, And with the help of your church, Father, that you would help us to be men and women that hold on to the faith that you've given us through Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray the areas of our lives that need to be conformed more into the image of Christ, Lord, that you would help us to put to death sin in our lives. Help us to put to death the things of of earthly nature and and God that, that we would put on the righteousness that you called us to. That is a new creation in Christ, Lord, that we would live in light of that, that we would truly walk by faith, and Lord, that we would be a living example to others around us of what does it mean to be a citizen of heaven. Lord, for those areas that we've failed, we thank you for the grace that you have given us in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the promises that you've given us, Lord, that you will never let us go, that you will continue to hold us fast to the very end. And so, Lord, we hold on to those promises today, and we ask, God, that you would strengthen us in those. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.